So I'd like to bring up our last storyteller, Christian Hughes, who's with Kingsley Association, Drafting Dreams, a former GBA intern, all around amazing guy, and is wearing a button. He just took off his jacket that says, do it with an architect. <laughs> Good evening. So this is a humbling experience for myself. Um, as a former GBA intern, I used to love this event. So to be able to speak is very humbling and to see a lot of people that are responsible for my success here is very humbling as well, so thank you. First, I wanted to shout out a group of my neighbors. Well, they're not, we're not neighbors yet, but the Larimer Co-Housing Group, hey. So even though we're not physical neighbors yet, we are already neighbors, and they are out here in large numbers, so I had to shout them out. Now I'm going to put this jacket back on with this button, <laughs> because it's cold in here. And I'm from Detroit, so if I say it's cold, it's cold. You want me to turn, turn around? Oh, you're taking a picture. You're, you're lucky you're Aunt Viv's husband. Okay. So obviously I'm going to take all seven minutes. <laughs> all right, so now for the storytelling. I'm not from here. I'm from Detroit. Graduated from high school in 2009 and went down to Hampton, Virginia to pursue the Master of Architecture degree from Hampton University. Um, Hampton University is a historically black college and university, of which I graduated from there at Mother's Day of 2014. But let's talk about that experience. So in January of 2011, um, that was when I first realized that I had to be self-sufficient. My mother had just lost her job in 2010, and I was having issues getting back into school, you know, dealing with the financial clearance line and the threat of having to pack it up and go home. But the fact that the money wasn't there, it did not stop me because you couldn't tell me anything. I was in classes and wasn't on the roll and I didn't care because I was not going to let finances stop me from getting this degree. I'd wanted to be an architect since I was six at this time, 2011, when I was 20. You, nothing was going to stop me or so I thought. Um, but, you know, it had just been by the grace of the people in the business administration that I had seen, I, you know, just interacted with them over my years at Hampton and had been genuinely nice to. You know, Hampton uh, attracts a lot of affluent African-American children and, you know, affluent children of all races get very snooty and snobby. <laughs> and I'm not affluent in the least bit, so I'm speaking to the custodian the same way I'm speaking to a CEO. And it had been just by my good graces that those people had remembered me in my hard time. And the provost herself gave me enough time to get my finances together to complete my education. And I would also receive funds from my church and from the Department of Engineering, completely circumvented the scholarship program, the scholarship application, all of the process because I needed the money. So got back into school. In my mind, I was already back in school, so it didn't matter. Moving forward, here comes fall of 2011. There was a curricular requirement for us to study abroad and go to France, travel to south of France. It was nice. And, but of course, you know, hey, mother's still unemployed, and this trip cost $2,700. So I sent out 100 letters asking for $50, and then I got the trip paid for. This was before GoFundMe, Kiva, any of that. Like, I know how to raise some money if I need to raise some money. But... Back to the point of self-sufficiency, I realized that my mother couldn't do it like she used to. Uh, I came up in a single-parent home, myself and my brother, but I was fortunate. My brother and I had a lot of things that some of my friends that had two parents did not have because my mother was college, is college educated. She's a chemical metallurgist. But at that moment when she lost her job, it was like, man, I've got to do this myself. So that instilled within me a self-sufficiency that was able to, um, I guess, get me to where I'm at now. So then we continue, you know, all of these things are happening. I'm like, yes, I'm almost an architect. Yes, I'm almost about to graduate. April of 2012 comes right before we leave for France. And I didn't want to be an architect anymore. <laughs> I'm 20. 
I wanted to be an architect for 14 years, and you know why? Now, it wasn't the money, because the money clearly could have kept me out. It wasn't the money, it wasn't anything. I could not get my project printed on those big 24 by 36 boards because there was somebody on the plotter printing his project at the highest of quality on the best of papers with the best of ink. It took three days. I was ready to print on a Wednesday. It took three days for him to print his project. So I had to print my project on an eight and a half by 11. I just went up to my professor, turned it in and said, there it is, walked away. That was the end of that. I called my mother, I said, I'm not gonna be an architect. I don't wanna be an architect because if my progress is gonna be inhibited by, I can't, by not being able to print all of these papers and I don't wanna do it. All these trivial things are gonna get in my way. I don't wanna do it. My mother just, okay, mm -hmm, okay. So I talked to my professor about that, and my professor said, oh, just relax, we're gonna to go to France, and you're gonna figure it all out in France, and then we're gonna laugh about it over a glass of wine. And that's, that's really what happened. But what, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I haven't stopped laughing about things over a glass of wine. I guess it's a cup of wine tonight. But, <laughs> so I got to France, and we traveled the south of France and ended up in Toulon. Worked with the city of Toulon on a project, and what really touched me, and when I found my, I, that's where I found my calling for architecture, is that the place we were working at in Toulon was a place that was, I guess it was one of the bombing sites in World War II, and it looked like World War II happened yesterday. And I, here I am, I'm in France, it's supposed to be bougie, bougie, je parle français, nicey, nicey France. And I'm seeing some things that I had, I'm from Detroit, I haven't seen some things I had not seen, ever, ever. And so I realized that architects are needed in America, in Europe, in uh, everywhere. So I gotta get it, get it back together, get that self-sufficiency back within myself and finish because someone somewhere needs me. So I have to get it together because someone somewhere needs me. So then, moving forward after that, I have to buy it over a glass of wine with my professor. She said, apply to the You Dream program. And I said, okay. Now mind you, this is my third year. You're supposed to do it in your fifth year. You Dream is an acronym for Urban Design Regional Employment Action for Minorities. And it's a program through Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture and the Remaking Cities Institute, of which my mentor who is in the house tonight, Dr. Erica Cochran is the program director. She is the bomb. So she told me to apply to this program and I applied to it once I shared my desires, you know, to work in the community and do urban design and all that good stuff. Little, little did I know that the associate professor was Mr. Raymond Gendros, uh, one of the founders of Urban Design Associates here in Pittsburgh. Um, Carnegie Mellon alum, board member for the program. I mean, like, was, my plug into the program, really. I didn't know this. She just, they just looked at my passion, they just looked at my talent, they knew what I like to do and said apply for this program. Little did I know I had an easy end. No way. I had no idea. But I got into that program, got here, met some really good people, but all throughout my career, my academic career, now my professional career, I've tried to just be a really genuine person. I have tried, I've tried, Lord knows I've tried. And it's been hard. And in, in a world where people are not genuine anymore, it's hard. And of course, it's double hard for me because my name is Christian, so I have to be a Christian. <laughs> and it doesn't help that my name is actually Christian James Hughes, so I, it's, I, it's, come on, you got to, come on. But I tried to be a really genuine person, but because I've been genuine to so many people in my life, in my hardest times, the people that I was genuine to, they were genuine back to me. And you know, my, my genuine kind-heartedness had been reciprocated. And my success here in Pittsburgh is attributed to, you know, all of the people along the way that I was kind to, that reciprocated that kindness to me. I was able to get here to Pittsburgh, um, work up under Dr. Erica Cochran. <laughs> One day I'll be Dr. Christian Hughes, like Dr. Erica Cochran. But I was able to work up under Dr. Erica Cochran, and you know, we developed a very genuine relationship and then transitioned to the internship portion of the Eugene Fellowship to Kingsley, where I worked under Fred Brown, who was the then associate director, now the um, president and CEO of HC Homewoods Children's Village. Because of that genuine relationship, I met Jenna Kramer, 
and Andrew Ellsworth, two of my favorite people, and I'm on the stage <laughs> because of them. I mean, you know, but I say all of this to say and give you all of these stories and all of the laughs to say that, you know what? Two things. It's good to be good to people. It truly is. It is good to be good to people. And secondly, a lot of your setbacks are setups for your comebacks. And you must remember that the thing that is in the slingshot Yes, it's in the slingshot, but the further it's drawn back, the further it's going to project itself for forward. So always remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.